Okay. I apologize. I did not realize that we were going to scheduled against um, and I imagine that's why we show people here. Um, so this is probably the last week. This is definitely the last week this year will occur at this time. Uh, we'll figure out the schedule for, um, for whether this year continues um, for next week. And I guess I'll give it mostly as a um, as a lecture this week. Um, well, um, okay, I'm going to put the uh, going to put the source sheet in the chat now. That, and I'm going to start. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so the um, what I want to discuss this week is the. Uh, is whether, I guess, whether the end of Shaul is inevitable at the start, and what the story of Shaul, as read by Chazal and various other uh, various other commentaries, teach us um, about the what it takes, you know, what it takes to be in power. Uh, what I expect to show is that there is a really fundamental controversy, which I think is not uh, unique to Judaism. Um, between what we might call a Hobbesian or a Machiavellian uh, portrait in which the fundamentally the most important thing of a person in power is to maintain not personal power, but institutional power. Um, and another one which argues that it is important that the, um, that the person with power uh, have all the virtues of people in private life and not just the political virtue of being able to maintain power. So that's that's a uh, an opening framing. It might be true, it might not be true. Uh, let's take a look at the narrative of the onset of Shaul's monarchy. We'll point out a couple of things that I think are um, evident in the text, and then um, and then we'll see we'll see what you think what you think they mean. Okay. So in Shmuel Allah, we uh, we we have a narrative which we're going to skip now, in which uh, there's a whole lottery and Shaul. Is, right, and Shaul is elected as as king. He's Nechbab and Hakelim. Uh, whether that means he's hiding in the Korak or polishing his armor, that doesn't matter to us right now. What matters is that the outset of it is clear that it's Shaul. And then Vayomer Shmuel Kol Am Hari Tem Asher Bachar Bo Hashem Ki Ein Kamo Bechol Am. Right, Shaul. If you seen that God chose him, he is unique. There is no one like him in the entire people. That we know that Shaul is taller than all the people. He's Meshich Mo Vamala Gavol Mikol Am. Question is, is he also unique in character or not? Okay, so Shmuel makes the announcement and have a group described as Kol Ha'am, and they all say, Long live the king. Then Shmuel reads them, or right, speaks to them, the Mishpat Hamlucha. That's Shmuel's apparently, uh, at least at least ambivalent, maybe you know, explicitly anti monarchic speech, uh, which he warns them that a king will become despotic and will seize all their things. And he writes it down. And he leaves it, you know, as a a dut before Hashem, as opposed to the Torah, which is an a dut of the contract to which the king is bound. Shmuel leaves Mishpat Hamlucha, which is much seems more in context a contract to which the people are bound relative to Hashem. Okay, so everybody says Shmuel speaks to the Am, not necessarily the Kol Am, the Mishpat Hamlucha. Shmuel sends everyone home. Then it says, "Vegam Shaul halach leveisel givasa," and Shaul also goes home. So there's a sort of ambivalence or ambiguity there. That is, can Shmuel send Shaul home? Um, right. What is Shaul's relationship to the to the people? So Shmuel sends everyone to their house, and Shaul also goes to his house, uh, although without perhaps an explicit instruction. And there are people, I guess, right? The Chayel probably is the uh, is you know people with a warrior spirit, and they go with him. They don't go to their house the way Shmuel told them to. So we don't know right whether this group around around um, Shaul is the epitome of what Shmuel wants, or is the beginning of what Shmuel warns about, which is the uh, right, which is a, a kind of autocracy. Then is another group. And the people, right, so generally, right, Chazal say Belial is a contraction of Beli Ol Malchut Shemayim, people who lack fear, who lack the yoke of heaven. There, it's not a good thing. What exactly it means is not uh, is not clear. Um, people of no account, people uh, uh, unserious people, whatever it may be. 
Uh, in what way will this one redeem us? So, I would have thought, we'll see, I think that other people disagree that the calling of Shaul is pretty darn uh, dismissive, right? You know, is this going to save us? Um, and they despise, they degrade Shaul. And they don't bring him a mincha. Whether that means whether that means that they actually don't give him a present, so and that Shmuel actually wanted everyone to give Shaul a, a, a present, although it never says so explicitly, or it means that they just didn't go pay their respects to him literally, that they despised him. So there's there is a group, even though Shmuel sends Kola Am Yishlaveso, and everybody said Yechihamelech, but it seems like the Yechihamelech, unless the Vnei are not part of the Kola Am, which is hard to say. It seems like the Yechimelech was not entirely sincere. And people say, well, you know, what is the Sha'ul going to? Right? They don't take Sha'ul uh, as, um, as seriously, I guess, um, with his new appointment. And he, Sha'ul, is as if he is silent. So what does what that mean that he really doesn't notice them? Or, um, or it means that he notices them and he pretends not to notice them? Or does it mean he notices them and doesn't believe he can do anything now, but bides his time, um, right? That's what you get from Beharishi Akov Ad Boam, that uh, right, that he's waiting for some other occasion to express him, right? To express his uh, his anger and disappointment. But right now, Shaul does not respond to at least a section of the people uh, explicitly treating him, saying Mayoshin is it, and explicitly being mivazehim, uh, explicitly degrading him. Okay, then what happens? Nachasha Amoni. Sets um, a besieges Yavish Gilad. Um, the people uh, sue for peace, and Nach and Nachash Amoni sets what he thinks are humiliating terms for a peace that he'll never accept. You're right. Let me cut. Let me cut out one of your eyes. And it turns out that the people will say, "Well, that's better than dying," but they're not willing to do it immediately. So they say, "Give us seven days, and we'll send messengers throughout all of Israel. And if nobody is Moshia, right, picking up on Mayoshi and Uzeh, im ein Moshia Tanner, if nobody comes to save us." Then we'll go out and you can pluck out one of our eyes. Okay, so it seems like Nachash, Nachash is going to permit this. So Nachash doesn't actually just want, sorry, Yavesh Gilad. Nachash actually is hoping either that nobody will respond to their plea for help. And his, it seems clear that his demand, <clears throat> the purpose of his demand is to humiliate, uh, to humiliate the whole uh, B'nai Israel. So either he's hoping they will send their best against him and he'll defeat them and that way he'll uh, dominate all of Israel, or he's hoping that they won't even bother and uh, defeat Israel. So the Malachim end up showing up in Shaul, and they speak this as uh, Am. The Anfei Chayel with Shaul don't seem to have um, have any mention later in the text. It's sort of a mystery. Um, and right, everybody cries, and Shaul apparently hasn't heard yet. Now Shaul comes Achareha Bakar Min which seems to mean that Shaul has not changed his lifestyle since becoming king. And the Yomar Shaul, right here we have the opposition. They said Mayoshi was there, and Shaul says Malam Kiyevku. Why is everybody crying? Uh, possibly suggesting that their crying is unserious in the same way that they suggested that his appointment as king is unserious. And so they tell him Divrei and Feyavish, and now all of a sudden Vatislach Ruach Elokim Al Shaul. So Shaul has some kind of uh, spiritual uh, or awakening, or some kind of you know some kind of infusion of power. When he hears these words, he gets very angry. And what he does is uh, he does an un pilegish begiva. In the episode of the concubine of Giva, that's uh, a, a capstone or a summary of the, in, the interpersonal breakdowns, the social breakdown of the Book of Judges. Where remember, the Book of Judges uh, ascribes to some its breakdown too. There are no, right, at least in some sections too, there, is, there was no king in Israel. Everybody did what they do. So they, the episode of the concubine of the Giva is triggered by chopping up the dead concub the dead and violated concubine and sending her throughout the uh, th throughout Israel except for uh Benjamin where it happened where it happens. So Shaul instead chops up at Semed Bakar, or he, chop he chops up um, right a, a pair of uh, oxen, uh whatever it's semed, and he sends it sends it out saying, Whoever doesn't follow Shaul and Shmuel, it's not clear whether Shmuel was consulted about this or not. Um, this is what's going to happen to their cattle. He doesn't threaten them, but he's going to do this to their cattle. And there's a, now there's a pachat Hashem. Shaul has a uh, ruach elokim. The people have a pachat Hashem, and they all veizuki shechad. Everybody is unified. And Shaul, uh, Shaul, um, 
organizes them. Um, they, he sends a message back to Yavesh Gilad, we're coming. Yavesh Gilad sends a message which may be deceptive to Nachash that will come out tomorrow. So he won't suspect he won't suspect anything. And the next day, Rebbe Shaul, having set a military strategy, shows up first thing in the morning in Nachash um, uh encampment, and he destroys um, he destroys Amon, right? So as opposed to Bnei Israel, who with the Pachad of Shem and them go out ki Echad, the right, no, there are no Shnaim Yachad. Right? So whereas Bnei Israel are unified, um, not that the, the army of Nachash is uh, right, every individual becomes isolated. Okay, now, Vayomer Ha'am El Shmuel. So the people say to Shmuel, Miha Omer, Shaul Yimlo Chalenu, Tenuhu Anashim Unimitim. Who are the people who said, this is presumably written uh, right within the Bank, who are the people who said, Shaul Yimlo Chalenu? Right? Who are these people who said, you know, who, who expressed doubt that Shaul could be a king? Tenuhu Anashim Unimitim. Give them, right, give them and we will kill them. Now, I have to note, so it's not clear whether these people are the same people who earlier said Mayoshi and Uze were different people. Uh, my preferred reading is that it's the same people and they have uh, forgotten uh, what they said previously, right? You know, they, they, uh, there are lots of studies, I think, showing that people um, end up convincing themselves that they voted for the victor in an election. Uh, so I would like to read it that way. It's not demonstrable, but I would like to read it that it's the same people who previously said Mayoshi and Uze. Um, now say, who are those people who mock Shaul? Now there are people who try and distinguish between Mariyoshi Inuze and Shaul Yim I think we'll see that somebody's going to say, right, it's obviously not the same, not, not only is it not the same people, it's not even referring to the same people, I prefer to say it's the same people, and they say, give us the people and we'll kill them, but the interesting thing is, they don't say this to Shaul, they say this to Shmuel, but Shaul interjects, and he says, lo yumat ish bayom hazeh, Nobody will die today. Because today God made a true on Israel. So they said, And this is, I think, why it's much better to read as the same people. So Shaul responds subtly, So it did work out that way. Nobody will die today. Okay, right. So this is as opposed to above where Shaul was macharish. He was silent when they mocked him. Here Shaul speaks up. When they right, when they threaten the, uh, to kill the people who mocked him, although he still has to speak up, okay. And then Shmuel says to the people, "Let's go anoint Shaul king again," and they all go to Shaul, um, and right, everybody is very happy. Okay, so the the episodes that we are primarily interested in is the, when Shaul is mocked, he says he's kimacharish, uh, and then when people propose executing the people who mocked him, uh, Shaul says, nobody is going to die today. So do we see those, those responses to silence and his refusal to execute as evidence of excellent private character? He is not interested. He is not, it's not about his ego and he is not interested in revenge. Do we see them as examples of terrible political character in that he Right. How can he possibly establish his kingship if he allows people to be uh, without penalty? And when in the heat, in the excitement of the moment, he loses track of the bigger picture that they're uh, right, that he, once again, that he has a chance to establish his monarchy. Uh, or you can take a model, which they're both true. They establish almost private virtue and his political lack of virtue and a person, a fundamentally good person, cannot be king. Right? Those I would set out as the the three easiest models um, for what uh, for what happens here. Um, right, one is private virtue, which translates into public virtue. One is a private private virtue, which is antithetical to um, to public to public virtue, and the other is that it nothing. It is neither private nor public virtue uh, for him to uh, for him to do this. Okay, so let's take a look at the way the Gemara framed this. Now, this this Gemara occurs in the context we have to study a deeper context. Shaul's kingdom ends in disaster, and it ends in disaster in um, it really in two parts. There is a disaster of his failing, it seems, to 
uh, to complete the genocide of Amalek, which leads to Shmuel abandoning him, and then the slow motion disaster of his all of a sudden becoming attached, not only himself, but dynastically the kingship, and that leads to a uh, right to attempts to continual attempts to kill David, and which fail, and eventually, of course, he's like, he he loses the battle to push him along with his sons, and his dynasty is ended. Um, so the Gemara here above above the section we've done, the Gemara quotes the uh, right Alti Tzadik Harbe with Alti Tzadik Harbe. That means don't be like Shaul who didn't finish Melchamed Amalek. Uh, the model seeming to be seems to be that the reason he doesn't finish Amalek is because of some notion of of Tzidkut, whether that Tzidkut is mercy or Tzidkut meaning this way he has more more things to sacrifice to God. Valti uh, Rasha Harbe is the Shaul ending up massacring the city of Nov in order to, uh, in, as, in revenge for David. And obviously the Gemara seems to be setting a connection between his failure to commit the, to finish the genocide here and his committing a form of genocide there. So that's a background, that's that's a framing that's earlier in the Gemara, but we're, um, the Gemara then later on says, Amar Avira Amar Malo Nimshecha Malchut Beit Shaul. Why was um, Shaul's monarchy, why didn't Shaul's monarchy become dynastic, right? It's not talking about why Shaul's personal uh, monarchy didn't, survive, uh, didn't, didn't last, but why didn't it become dynastic? Because his, his family had no weaknesses, right? there were no iffy things uh, as to whether they're really halakhically able to marry in the Jewish community um, in their background. Because real Yochanan said in Rishim Ben Yosedek, you can't appoint pers- a person as leader in the community unless they have already a compassionate transceiver. You have to have you know, a bucket of rats to, uh, right, hanging on your back so that you never get too prideful. Whatever you think that you're too much of a person, people are just like, ah, that person, right? He's got, you know, he, he's right. Look at his family background. Um, so this is what Varim says, you're, that the king can't has to be within your community because you can never let them get uppity. So this extends it and says not only they have to be um, from your community so they can't develop aristocratic pretensions as if they came from somewhere else, but they should really be among the, um, I don't know what the opposite of blue bloods is um, in, your, in your community. Okay, right, so that's we understand why Shaul doesn't continue. He doesn't continue ironically because his family is virtuous. Okay, now Maravidah Marav, Mithneiman and Shaul. Why is Shaul punished? We have to figure out right, in what way is Shaul punished, and um, right. But Ravida Morav assumes that Shaul is punished for something. So why is he punished? He's punished with Nesham Machal Al Kivodo because he forgave his honor. Shnei Mar, as it says in our pasuk of Nevi Liyalamru, that right. Then these people, these worthless people, say, Mayoshienuzeh, and what is he? Vahi Kimacharish. Okay, so now we know where Shaul was Mochel on his kavod. So where is he punished? It says, So that is a little bit um, odd because how and in, in what way is Shaul punished? Shaul actually is is established in his kingship on the basis of the Nachasha when he's invasion. Um, he doesn't suffer, it seems, at all. Uh, so what does it mean? So it could be that we're saying that uh, Shaul, the monarch, was published and was punished in the sense that because he forgave his honor. That's what emboldened Nachash. If Nachash had seen Shaul uh, responding angrily to the people who were Mevazem and saying, you say, well, take this. So the Nachash would never have done it. But it's because Nachash saw the, saw the weakness of Shaul. That's why he attacks. Could be. It's still an odd use for the word Nachash. Um, okay, and the Gemara then you know, see, emphasized in other ways that it was inappropriate for him to be Maharish. Because right, we now talk about Tamei Chachamim, we're supposed to be uh, no came but no tear, right? You're not a Tamei Chacham. The Gemara, uh, uh, sorry, the Gemara, the Gemara, the Gemara, sorry, the Gemara says, "Call Tamei Chacham and no came but no tear." Kedachash, I know Tamei Chacham. If you don't seek revenge, you're not a Tamei Chacham. So the Gemara says, "Hang on a sec. What about the virtue, the virtue of commandments? Don't seek revenge, right? Don't t- right? Don't don't exact compensation." So the Gemara says, "That's talking about money." Uh, okay, the Gemara says, no, it's not talking about money because Rava said that forbearance, avir al not not insisting on what's due you, that is where if God forgives you of everything. So it's an enormous expression of private virtue if you do exactly what Shaul did. 
you're Shomeil Bono, right? You're, right? You right? You listen to other people uh, speak ill of you, and you don't respond. So the Gemara says, no, that's only the the Mephaisu le Mephais, that at least for Tamini Chachamim, and I think by implication kings, you're supposed to be, you're supposed to be forbearing when people appease you. But if people are simply humiliate you, then your position requires you, this Gemara seems to think, your position requires you, uh, if you have the power, to exact some sort of punishment for that, and Shaul failed. This is a very stark claim, right? So Mipnei Mane and Ashaul, Mipnei Shemachal al Kvodo. So even though generally, being Ma'avir al Midotecha, which means in large measure forgiving insults to your Kavod, is a virtue which causes forgiveness of sins, it causes Shaul to be punished because it has no place in public life. Right? Rashi makes it even uh, more stark. Rashi says, why is Shaul punished? In what way? Why was Shaul punished? By having something happen that would cause him to lose the kingdom. What is that thing? Presumably it's the break that happens at Amalek. So Shaul's failure to complete the execution of Amalek is a direct product of his um, of his being mochel his kavod here. So if we take a look at the narrative of Amalek, we'll look at it now. We'll see that um, it's not at all clear that it's Shaul actually Shaul's decision not to not um, not to not to uh, kill a gag melech Amalek in the sheep. He right when Shmuel challenges him, that's not what God said. He says, but the people said. So it could be that uh, we're saying here is that Shaul, because he's, he's when Shaul is mochel in his kavod. He's not actually being mochel on this code. It's not that he's not being macharish because he feels nothing. He's being kim macharish because he is unwilling to um, engage in confrontation. And that right, that unwillingness to enforce his kavod, right, which not because it was a virtue, but because he simply is um, non-confrontational. So that leads to his the eventual loss of his kingdom. That's a different read. Right, in which it's not right, it's not a virtue of Shaul at all, and there's no conflict between private and public virtue. That maybe if Shaul had, um, if Shaul had been, um, had had been actually actually uh, um, forgiving of people's attacks on his code, maybe that would have been fine as well. This is a display, but this is a display not of virtue, but of uh, but of weakness. It could be. Um, so, Rash, so Rashi says, okay, right, so now we have to read it. But the Gemara just quotes the Pesach of Yal Nachash Emuni, and sounds like that was the punishment. So Rashi says, quite astonishingly, if they should be killed, Machoto Machal Kavod, the Gila Alat Moshe no Kedailim Lo. When Mochil and his Kavod, he demonstrated that he was unable to rule, he unfit to rule. Uchtiv Vayal Nachash Emuni, Matzgana de Milsa. The end of the story of Nachash is that now Shaul is fully established and the people say, okay, now you can take revenge on the people who, right, who mocked you. Who amar lo yumat And he says that nobody will die today. So it's very hard to read Rashi in conformity with my attempt. Rashi seems to think that it is fundamentally a failure of political virtue in Shaul not to enforce his majesty. Okay. Um, Marsha in the Chedush uh, to, to Yoma and elsewhere says, and we, and we say in the, in the first parak of Kedushin and, and in many other places, the that a king is not capable of waving his arm. But and now the Marsha says not only is the king not capable of waving his honor, but which means that if the king says it's okay, you can treat me this way, you're still not allowed to treat you th- to treat them that way. So the Marsha says there it's explicit, and uh, not so I'm not so sure that not only is it ineffective if the king is Mochel is Kavod legally, you're still legally liable to honor him, but it is forbidden for the king to honor him. Why? Because the things the king stands in place of God. So the king's honor is not his own. The king's honor is God's honor, and therefore Shaul did something um, not just politically wrong. It is something religiously wrong 
uh, when he was mochil as kavod because he violated a mitzvah of the Torah. Okay, what is the mitzvah of the Torah? Som tasim alecha melech. Um, in my written Torah this week, I have a whole uh, right but uh, that what does it mean Lafishu Kodama Kom? Does it just mean because the Torah established the mitzvah? Does it mean that the king actually represents the monarchy or a third position the king doesn't king like I said, the king actually represents the uh, the monarchy of God, either because God appointed him or because it's a symbolic thing, or I pointed out that there are others who right who don't see the king as representing God at all. They see the king as representing the people. Um, and that I think is the model of Soloveitchik develops. Um, and so for the king can't be mochel as kavod um, because it's really not his, it's the national kavod and there are enough communities between them as to maybe there are circumstances where the king can forgive his kavod. But for now, right, if we're just reading commentaries on the text, Rashi says it was forbidden for Shaul to, forg- uh, to forgive his honor and that's why he was an unfit king and that led inevitably to his losing the monarchy. Um, right, the Marshall says that it's because it's forbidden. Okay, the Chida uh, says something a little bit more, a little uh, more complicated, I think. So when Sh- when Shmuel says after this whole episode, let's go to Gilgal and reinaugurate the monarchy. Uh, so why does Shmuel say this? He says, "Ki nei Shmuel machalam avazim v'amar hayom lo yimat ish beYisrael." Shmuel forgave the people, and not only he forgave the people at the time, right? Because that was Kimacharish. Remember, we said that. He's Kim Acharish, that just mean, might mean parallel to Yaakov, that he's waiting for an occasion. Well, now he has the occasion because now he has triumphed over Amon and everybody is right, everybody would be on his side now. They're encouraging him, please, right, please show that you're a king by executing, or at least by, right, by executing. Give us the people who mocked you and will execute them. So now Shmuel looks at this and saying, Shaul is starting his monarchy off wrong. He had right, he, even if he was okay, if he's okay the first time because that the king is not allowed to be mochel in his kavod doesn't mean that the king should seek to um, to demonstrate his kavod when it won't work. That just leads to civil war. So we can understand Shaul having been kimacharish. But now there's no right now. We, now is the occasion, and instead he says nobody's going to die today. So Shmuel is very worried that Shaul is starting his kingship off wrong. So what does Shmuel do? So Lozeti King Sat Amar Shmuel Luchu Benelcha Gigal Unichadesh Shamamlucha Kilu Meata Matzchel Tamalucha. So Shmuel says, you know what? Let's do a reset. We're going to say that wasn't up till now. Shmuel has not really been king. That was just a, a nomination, um, and he hadn't been confirmed. Now that he's been confirmed, we're going to coronate him again, and now. So Shmuel is hoping that Shaul will start with a clean slate, and now he's really king. And now that he's really king, he's not going to stop being Mochel's kavod, right? So this is a really interesting read in which, from the very beginning, Shmuel realizes that Shaul is doing it wrong, um, and he tries to fix it by giving Shaul a restart. But there are only so many so many do-overs, and Shaul keeps making the same mistake over and over again. Okay, the Benarat Hamaora, the less famous uh, Benarat Hamaora, is the the biography here tells you. Uh, right, this is the uh, roughly the same, the same, uh, the same time period in the 14th century. So they write this is a you know a, an ethical book, but here's here's what he says, which seems to me to be diametrically opposed to what we just read. The the um, scripture the scripture um, um, outlines 13. Um, right, 13 or explicate 13 positive attributes regarding Shaul. Uh, one is that he's humble, and the other is the second is he could hear people seek to humiliate him and be silent. And he quotes our Pasuk. He pretended he didn't know. So that's the right, so that seems to be a virtue. And Gimel Sheyam Ochel Albono, and he forgave. And not only was he silent, but he forgave it for real. Okay, now this is in a list of positive, a list of virtues. So, right, Shloshes Har Mido to vote. So, I think the simplest reading is that he, you know, seemingly goes against this Gemara, or he wants to distinguish between being Mochel Al Kvodo, which is something that we that goes beyond being silent, and goes beyond. It goes beyond, um, does, you know, 
turning down executions. There's something else he did wrong. The simplest thing is that he's reading the text independently of the Gemara, and he says, how can you possibly um, think that it's not that Shaul's wrong to be um, to be attacked this way? These are virtues everywhere else. We could come up with a fancy reading again that the Gemara Mora is saying that the that Rabbi Moriyana is saying is that there are um, that Shaul is a model of private virtue which has nothing to do with whether he's a good king. And in fact, it, to be a good king, you have to stop being mochel al which means that you have to give up your private virtues. So you have to decide if, right, whether you think the Menorah Ma'or is against the Gemara, or you think the Menorah Ma'or is very subtly reading together with the Gemara. It gets, I think, um, even more complicated when we look at the Rabag. So let's see, the Rabag says, Rabag, so Rabag's parish is, you know, has his explication of the text per se, and then he has the morals of the story, where he calls it toalot, right? The, the useful things you can learn from the story. So he says, the 16th he derives from the story is, right? it's, it's, it's fitting for people to give honor to the king and bless him, right? That's, that's the story where he says, right? It's not fit for, for a complete person, uh, right? for a person of virtue. We should not be affected. Right? Should, they, should not have any, uh, any work, should not work any way on him. That other people are saying things opposite him. Uh, right? So if right, you're not supposed to be affected by people um, by people opposing you. So you're not supposed to be affected by people simply failing to express kavod. Right? It, the appropriate thing is to tolerate this, to endure this. That's, and to teach you this lesson. That's why the Tanakh says that Shaul was Macharish. Okay. Um, and furthermore, he says, So not only was this with Shaul's willingness to tolerate the people being Mazehim. An expression of a positive uh, moral mida of not of not being affected by uh, what other people do to you, uh, but also it was also fitting for intolerance, right? Why? Um, also, he's the beginning of his kingship, and maybe people will dismiss him for the slightest reason. So, therefore, Shaul, right? Shaul was displaying not only a moral virtue but a political virtue when he's Maharish the first time. Um, okay, and then he says, right, the, 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 the 18th Bida is that when a person is appointed to a job, so having jobs are expensive and therefore people should bring him money so that he can have, he can, he can maintain his position uh, appropriately, um, right? Therefore the people should have brought him in Chat to Shaul so he could behave like a king, right? That he could behave with the dignity fit for a king. Um, right, so Shaul was not ready to do this, right? Shaul was not behaving like a king. He's still a char because he doesn't have the money to do it. And not only that, Shaul doesn't like uh, doesn't like power anyway. Um, so people should bring in presents. Okay, right. So that's an interesting uh, notion, right? It's, you know, we have trouble in America thinking that people should bribe people, but uh, as right, that's a civic virtue. To, uh, but uh, right here's a counterpoint, uh, right, which you certainly saw in Rome all the time, that it's unreasonable to expect people to fulfill the social obligations of office without having lots of money. So you have to make sure that if people who don't have lots of money are appointed, that they are given lots of money. Um, and you still sort of do this campaign cash, I guess. But my point here is that according to Ral Bag, um, it is both, both a personal and a political virtue for Shaul to be silent uh, at the outset. Uh, and then he doesn't mention anything about being machil as kavod later. So it sounds like Rabag thinks that political and public virtue can mesh. Um, and he also is uh, seeming, seemingly reading against the Gemara, although you could, of course, claim that he, you know, that he thinks that, okay, the first time and not the second time. Or you can say that uh, what Rabag says is that it's inappropriate to be affected by what others say. And that's right, and Shaul. Um, and Shaul is Maharish, but he doesn't he doesn't say anything about the second time. Um, and maybe he thinks that Shaul's you're not supposed to be affected, but doesn't mean you're not supposed to act. You're supposed to act as the Ramam says, right? Often 
it, right, often it's the obligation of the perfect person is to express anger that they don't feel in order to convey the, uh, the moral truth to the less sophisticated people around them. Maybe. Okay, here is uh, a Bravadel's reading of the, uh, of the story. Uh, so when the Jews saw Shaul's success against Amon, Amru, they said, um, who are the people who said mockingly, will Shaul rule over us? People who said this, right, said this uh, mockingly, give us the people who said this and we'll kill them. So he explicitly describes Shaul here the second time as being Mochel al Kavod. This is what Shaul meant. Even though the law is, the appropriate law is that whoever denigrates the king should die, and you're right, the people who denigrated me after I was appointed king should die. But today, nobody, right? But today, everybody, even the people who mocked me before, they came out to the army now, and God did a chua through them. So it might have been appropriate for me to kill them yesterday, but just because it was appropriate for me to kill them yesterday doesn't mean that it's appropriate for me to kill them today. Because unlike the judicial system where verdicts are final and changes in your attitude affect nothing, um, execution for political sins um, can, in fact, uh, become moot because right because uh, be uh, right be superseded by subsequent virtuous actions. And he says further, and this is a right. This is a good thing, right? Among Shaul's good characteristics, that the people attribute the victory to him. And he attributes the victory to them. So Rabag explicitly said that being Maharish was a both a, both a private and a political virtue. And Ravanel says the second case, when he doesn't execute people, is um, among his good qualities. And it seems very hard for me to argue that uh, it's not a public virtue as well here. Uh, so what is Shmuel doing? So um, right, he Shmuel affirms he doesn't overrule Shmuel as he does later with Agag and say no you have to kill these people. He just says but now that everybody supports you let's in fact go renew the king. Everybody is really happy. So it sounds to me like Ravenel's reading is that Shmuel actually handles this correctly. Um, everything goes well, and Shmuel says good. Right, you have now right correctly understood that even. Right, you know, we can put it all together as one reading. When, when the people first mock Shaul, he right he agrees that he should kill them, although hopefully he is not doesn't think that emotionally. He thinks that dispassionately, but he thinks that he can't carry that out now. He's going to have to wait to do it because he's not strong enough yet to execute rebels or execute mockers without um, without launching civil war. And then when he has the power, he no longer needs to. And that's really, uh, right, that's really excellent, excellent politics. And Shmuel looks at Shaul and says, good job, but you do have to do this, right, you do it, but let's reinaugurate the kingship, not the way, uh, right, not because that's the way of evading their, your responsibility to kill them, but because that's building on your success. Um, so I think that the, the Abravanel, and you can read Abravanel to all those, really is reading it against the Gemara, and whatever reason Shaul loses the kingship is not because of this. Shaul loses the kingship because something happens that either that he loses this virtue uh, or that he or that he um, no longer uses this virtue, this virtue properly. Okay, the Malbim um, says the uh, says the following. Um, so we said, right, the Malbim says, Bune Vilial, Kvara Marnu, Shehamona Am Kivnulara. Okay, so the Malbim comes up with a whole with a New, much more sophisticated reading of what's going on politically. Shmuel didn't like the idea of appointing a king. Why? Because he thought most of the people wanted a king, not for the right reason, whatever the right reason is. They wanted a king for the wrong reason. They wanted to be like all the other nations. 
right? right? They thought that a king, that appointing a king would secularize the regime, uh, right? remove the yoke of Torah from them. Um, okay, and, right, and right, and they would end up following the, the ways of all the nations. Um, but when they saw that Shaul was actually picked by God, and that right, and that he, uh, right, that his social group were the people who feared God, um, right, which would seem to suggest that Shaul would be a God-fearing king all his life. So then they said, "Who's going to redeem? Right? Who's going to save us?" Because what they meant by that was not a, or was not mocking Shaul's military capacity. What they meant was that Shaul would not launch the social secularist revolution they were seeking. Uh, right, Shalia Fikri Minus had only won, they wouldn't gain from him their true purpose, which was to become like all the nations. Um, so, Malbim Mikos Maria, not sure Maria is here, uh, that it was appropriate, that's my fault, I should know, it was appropriate that in addition for God choosing him, that Shaul should also be chosen by the people, right? It should be that his, elect, his election should be democratically affirmed. Gamkain, Yaskimu Kulama, everybody agree with him. Uh, right, but th therefore, right, since the Malbim says that in principle the monarchy should not just be chosen by God, but it should be chosen by God and affirmed, and God's choice has to be affirmed by the people. So, since not everybody accepted it, so radically, right, the king cannot be inaugurated unless there's a consensus, even if God chooses him. And so, Shaul says, Look, there are people who there are people who don't accept me, therefore, I'm not king. And so he goes home. Everybody else goes home until right. And when Shmuel sends everyone home, what he means by sending everyone home is, you know what? We tried to appoint a king, we failed. And that's your fault, not on me. We failed because you didn't all accept him. But then God arranges the victory against uh against them. And then now the people now the kingdom is uh is uh, is um renaissance with the support of the entire people. Right, that's rules, right? So, what the Malbim does is he accomplishes a um, he accomplishes that the people's mocking of of Shaul is not is actually not as we saw earlier. Right? We saw a suggestion that maybe Shaul was trying Shmuel was trying to cover for Shaul. No, it really was the case that Shaul was not king until everyone uh, until everyone accepts it. Right. So that is really the Malbim's Israeli kiad atza lo yadinam kimeroid mamafus achar shadayan. Uh, right, so he, right so you, there was no right of Shaul to punish them prior to this because they, uh, right, they didn't accept his kingship. And, the, um, and therefore it says, what Shaul is saying is not, oh, it would be inappropriate today to, uh, it would be inappropriate today to kill them because today is such a great day and not, oh, they did the chua, so it would be inappropriate to kill them because now they've shown virtue. All he's saying uh, what he's saying is, today is the day that I became king. So obviously, I can't punish them for the uh, for the past. Okay, so the Malbim takes that very seriously, and here again, um, Shaul is completely justified, um, and there's no problem with Melech Shemachal Al Kavodo because he wasn't yet Melech. Okay, as Rabbag, however, um, has a when has a reading that. Completely reverses the Gemara. It's the 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 chat. He says, "Maybe Shaul Shaul meant the second time was I'm not going to kill them today, but tomorrow Shaul executes them." So now the Rabbah has totally reread Shaul's character because, in fact, in this case, uh, right, the the reading here is not that Shaul did the right thing the first time, but not the second time. Shaul did the right thing the first time by being silent because that was politically the right, the necessary thing to do, and now he does the right thing, perhaps by um, perhaps by delaying the execution, and then in the end, perhaps he does the right thing by executing them, or perhaps the delay is a harbinger of what happens by um, of what happens by uh, by Amalek. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, oh, but now the Rabbi says the reverse is Omar Shmuel Yimad Yish Bayomazeh. So the Rabbi says the first possibility is that Shaul 
really means to kill them tomorrow. The second possibility is that Shaul says something that the people can interpret as he'll kill them tomorrow, but he really, what he wants to do is save them from the but it saved them from the people. So that's also a very interesting, at the very beginning of his reign in this reading, Shaul feels compelled to hide from the population what he's doing. Um, so that's right, that uh, sounds like a, uh, the wrong kind of mochel al Clodo, because it's not just his mochel al Clodo. what he's doing wrong is not the mochel al Clodo of allowing people to humiliate him directly, what he's doing is being right, being mochel on, right on his right to tell the people what his true intent is. I think that that uh, both readings of uh, of Rabbach, so the first reading makes Shaul more politically successful. You would have thought that the worry. So why does he fail later? What's wrong with killing him a day later? Um, and the second one says that no, right, really from the beginning, Shaul's failure is he's not willing to confront the people. And then we have to decide. Is it really the same kind of failure when he's not willing to confront the people about in reverse about not killing, right? When the people, um, when uh, I guess the same thing. The people, right? When the, the pe- here he does here the people. So it's reverse, right? Here the people want to kill people, and Shaul fools. Uh, Shaul finds a way to save them, and there the people don't want to kill, and Shaul find and Shaul finds a rationale for uh, for excusing them. All right, so that we can that we can build a midah, connect a midah. Okay, the last position that I want to go over with you, and then I want to um, put a context in it, is uh, Revel Yashiv, right, the great 20th century figure. So he gets us to the end of the Shaul story. He says, Mivu'ar medevar he Rambam. It's clear from the Rambam. It's nahu b'mechiyas amalek, sheminu Yisrael halei melech kodem, ve'en din mechiyas amalek below melech. So it's entirely clear that from the Rambam that you can't go Launched a an offensive war against Amalek to fulfill the mitzvah without a king. Okay, so hashda kaasi shaul v'chamal akanim elatzon become a war. Right. So now, why why is Shaul doing this? This is against the um, the halacha. So right, how can Shaul do this? So Rabbi Yasha says the following. Right. Shaul when when he forgives the. He thinks that Shaul forgives the children and not just the sheep, right? That he thinks that Shaul actually is acting out of mercy uh, when he forgets, right? When he forgives, when he doesn't kill Amalek. But how can he do this? It's against Halacha. She's right? Halacha is you have to wipe them all out. So what Shaul did was he uh, abdicated. When, right, when he went at the end of the war, Shaul abdicates. Uh, so he thinks, even though a king is not allowed to forgive his own army, but the king is allowed to abdicate. Um, right? Which, well, right? Now, this, this Rabbi Yashu thinks this is wrong because a Shaul is anointed and an anointed king can't abdicate. Um, he just, right, all he can do, but Shaul thinks that the problem is being king and not enforcing your honor. But there's nothing wrong with stopping being king. And that, he thinks, he says, well, now that I'm not king anymore, there's no mitzvah of Mechiat Amalek. Because the mitzvah of Mechiat Amalek only applies when there's a king. Nimsa, so Rabbi Yashi says, Nimsa de lo avar al bar Hashem. It's not that he um, transgressed the word of God. Ela ma'as bid bar Hashem. What he's doing is he's displaying um, derision for, right, uh, for the... Um, for the word of God, because he's implying that he is more moral than God. All right, I'll teach Sidi Karbe. That's a tatsaki, creates an excuse. So Yashu may very well be have particular targets in mind about the, the notion of people who uh, who think that the right, you know, which I say some point, sometimes like me, uh, who think that um, when there's a moral challenge in halacha, so your job is to find a way around it. But Yashif thinks that, that if that's what Shaul did, Shaul engaged in what happened to be wrong anyway halakhically, but he thinks that Shaul's halakhic error is not uh, right, it's forgivable. It's Shaul's belief that it would be right to engage in an evasion to avoid the that is, that, is, um, that, is, that is false. And that's how, in the end, um, he thinks that, right, he thinks the best reading of the Gemara. Is um, is the proper thing, and in the end, Shaul ends up 
uh, Shaul ends up being, you know, committing a massacre himself. Okay. So Yashiv has a, um, takes the, what he does is he takes the reading earlier people did and says that, uh, that Shaul was not yet king or really, or Shmuel acted to recreate the Malucha in order to create the impression that Shaul had not yet been king. And that's what excuses his, um, his Mechila Kavod. Um, actually, what um, here, here Shaul uh, deliberately uh, pre- right, abdicates as king always for the same thing because Shaul has private virtues and his private virtues are incompatible with the public need. And so either he or people around him are always trying to find a way to bridge that gap and they can't succeed in doing it. And that, would be one, that would be one way of reading it. Uh, it's not the way I want to read it. So here I'm going to mention a uh, story that I'm always, I think one always has to mention when everyone talks about this narrative of Shaul on the lake. And, uh, and every time I mention it, I mention how very deeply I'm ambivalent about it I am. I won't be able to explain that in depth this week. Um, but I'll at least try to give a context, right? So the word I always quote, which is from uh, Ravar Lichtenstein and from the Likud of uh, is that the reason Shaul loses the kingship is not because he doesn't kill Agag, but it's because by not killing Agag, he demonstrates that the killing of everyone else of Amalek was not a was not for the purpose of the mitzvah; it was for his own purposes, and therefore he was a mass murderer, and so mass murder was a really good reason. Is the uh, to lose the monarchy. So that the ambivalence is on the one hand, it, it removes the claim that to be a king you have to be ruthless. On the other hand, uh, it creates right. The argument is that um, that there are mitzvot that are so immoral that the only possible excuse you could have for them, doing them is for Hashem. So I want to try to complicate that a little bit. Um, because that's really scary, right? To claim that there are you know, the, it's particularly the worst mitzvot that you're not allowed to engage in moral reasoning about. So it's both a beautiful word and a dangerous word. Um, what I want to add this week is that according to um, standard halacha, actually Shaul's war against Amalek was not a standard halachic war um, because there wasn't peace on all the borders. We didn't, you hadn't satisfied all the criteria for Melchem and Amalek aside from the criteria of the king. And therefore the standard halacha is that the war is that Shaul goes to war against um, Amalek, only because Shmuel tells him as a hurat sha'a. It's actually a suspension of halakha as opposed to fulfillment of halakha. So there, uh, there is a, there is a, um, a hurat sha'a, um, the, the Sam Sofer argues with good, good ground, uh, although it's, it's hard in the particular case, a hurat sha'a has this special halakha, uh, at least a hurat sha'a tells you something that is otherwise a sur has a special halakha that it is an action that remains forbidden unless you do it lishma. Right? So Sam Sofer says that the it's horat sha'al, but be it one that has lasted for millennia, that you're allowed to write down, um, rather write down terash balpeh. But the Sam Sofer thinks that if you learn terash balpeh, not lishma, you're still violating the prohibition against writing down terash b'tav. So Melchim Amalek is not because intrinsically Melchim Amalek is that way. It's because this Melchim Amalek is that way. Then the question that occurred to me was, if you take this model that Milchem and Amalek, uh, when engaged in not for military purposes, is a hurat and can only be engaged in with perfect kavana, so whose kavana is controlling? The people's kavana or Shaul's kavana? It seems to me that everybody engaged and everybody engaged has to uh, have the perfect kavana. Um, so then, when Shaul uh, gives in to the people, it's not his private, it's not right, and it's not his private venture that uh, right, that you know, that's wrong. That he himself is now a murderer. What it means is that the entire war, in the first place, was murder. There was no hope because the people did not go out to war with this uh, with that intent. And then what Shaul should have realized, he should have said to Shmuel, you're telling me that there's a Ra'at Sha'ah to do this, but I tell you that the people don't have the spiritual capacity to do what you're demanding. So what Shaul really should have done then is refuse to go out to war. Um, And what happens when Shmuel meets him is that Shmuel discovers that Shaul took the people out to a war 
to fulfill the mitzvah which they were spiritually incapable of fulfilling. We could have the question about whether it would ever happen that they'd be spiritually capable of fulfilling it or whether that makes the, the actual mitzvah of the feminine malik, or at least the rush of the feminine malik, um, practically impossible. Um, and then, right, so that really is, I think, gives you a, a different insight into the relationship as to uh, between Shaul and Shmuel. The problem all along, uh, perhaps, is that Shaul does not have the capacity to get people to do things um, for the right reason. Um, he doesn't, right? Maybe that's, or maybe he just doesn't, he doesn't, he, he doesn't see his, he doesn't understand his moral responsibilities. Uh, in terms of affecting people's motives, right? so that I think that's that's um, that's not worked out well enough. Uh, so I apologize for that. I think I had it worked out better earlier, and I'm not satisfying myself now. Um, but I want to I want to set out that it's possible to I want I want to argue in the end for a reading, I guess, uh, which I am partial to, which doesn't make that sharp line between private and public virtue that it sounds like Rashi is saying. And I think I've shown. And a whole lot of Rishonim that even though Rashi is a reasonable reading of the Gemara, that it seems that many Rishonim uh, do not, and Achronim do not read the story that way. They don't see Shaul's private virtue as a, a kind of public vice that gener that uh, that deserves losing the losing the kingdom. So we have to figure out. So if it really is a private virtue at the outset uh, for Shaul to be Mochel al Kavodo, uh, why is it that at the end? Is giving into the people of Amalek turns into such a public vice. Um, and so I'm trying to find a way to, out of that by arguing that the vice there is not so much his unwillingness to confront the people um, about their failure to fulfill the command, it's his unwillingness to confront the people at the very outset when really if he had been willing to talk to them for real and find out what their motives were, he would never have gone to war in the first place. Okay, I hope I'll work it out better next time. Uh, thank you for listening. And now, uh, if anybody has any questions, as always, I will uh, stay as long as it takes to answer them. All right, I did warn that I would lecture this week, so that's my fault. Uh, if people just ended up having to tape record earlier or later, uh, and uh, wish everyone a great Shabbos. Thank you, sir.